very difficult for me to uh, come on after that act. <laughs> but um, I just want to say one or two things about the passage. We see young lady. Can you hear or hear me? Yes. yes. We see a young lady introduced. When you remember, she, she introduced um, certain the seal upon your heart. And she said, no, it's not her, it was him, actually. That's vital. He said, um, he thought that this poem brought out the faithfulness of love, the faithfulness of love, rather than the erotic side. And I thought that was beautifully put. And that sets me on to my final talk, which is about the victory of love. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. The love is strong as death, passion fierce as the grave. The flashes and flashes of fire, a raging flame. They're probably the best known lines in the whole poem about the supreme value of love. While the rest of the poem is taken up as, with a dialogue between the two lovers with a little bit of chorus here and there. Here the words seem like a declaration from the profoundest level of human experience, a statement of wisdom. I come back to this point. This song is part of the wisdom tradition, sweeping claim. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Wonderful statement in the New Testament from the first letter of St. John. But it's all there in this song. It's all there in this song. Don't let anybody persuade you that the Old Testament is about God's wrath and the New Testament about God's love. It's nonsense. There's a lot about God's love in the Old Testament, and not less, not least in this poem. How then does um, how then do we speak about this seal? In the world of the song, and indeed in many ancient cultures, personal seals were often hung around the neck or arm on cords. The seal was like a personal signature. It marked a person's word as binding. It provides evidence of honesty and integrity and indeed faithfulness. So in the book of Proverbs, also attributed to Solomon, that love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart. That love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart. And I said that I'd quote from my friend Stephen Reynolds. I hear. He suggests that these words, are, if they are indeed her words rather than the words of the poem, collective poet, are raised to the level of a divine command, as in Moses speaking as spokesman for God. These words that I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. Bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be frontlets between your eyes. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 and 8. The place between the eyes being the third eye of unitive vision, the eye of wisdom. According to the Christian teaching of Father Richard Rohr, and I know some of you know his writings, um, the concept of the third eye is a metaphor for non-dualistic thinking, non-dualistic. The way the mystics see in Royal's Council makes to imply the first eye, sensory input such as sight, and the second eye, the eye of reason, the eye of meditation and reflection. But they know not to confuse knowledge of depth or mere correct information with the transformation of consciousness itself. The mystical gaze builds upon the first two eyes. And it goes on, further, beyond the two eyes, beyond the eye of sight and the eye of reason. He refers to the, what Roa refers to, to this level of awareness as being having the mind of Christ. 
remember Paul's words in Philippians, let this mind be in you which is in Christ Jesus, who took upon himself the form of a servant and suffered until he died. In saying that, love is as strong as death, he is saying that love is like death, dying that the other may live, dying that the other may live. Redemptive love. She must disappear. And this is his rather persuasive explanation why it is at the end of the poem ends with separation. She says, Go back to your kingdom, be king, but I cannot go with you. I am not suited to be either your concubine or your queen. I cannot be either. So I must disappear. Her calling is to be in spiritual isolation, says Reynolds. But it's not spiritual isolation that is despair, because she has found the reality of love with him, even though it could not be consummated. But she's found an experience of loving him and being loved by him that sense of where she belonged in the world. She will never forget that he found her black and beautiful. Black and beautiful. So in this text we get many waters cannot, many waters, that is the trials of life, cannot quench love, nor floods, that is tears caused by separation, overwhelmed. So we end, reach the end of the song, full of tragic, of human pathos. There's no Hollywood end here. This is the end of a life which has been found meaning in love, but knows that there is no human consummation of this, as well as the prime heights of wisdom. And a word too about the fire. Love is strong as death, passion fierce as a grave. It flashes and flashes of fire, a raging flame. How does love resemble death? How is it to be compared to death? The answer may be that just as love may consume us in this life, if it's an overwhelming love, so death will certainly consume us at the end of life. For those who do yield to the power of love, love does indeed consume us like a raging flame. And in this image of fire, there is no doubt a deliberate echo of the biblical image of God as a devouring or consuming fire, which you find again in the early chapters of Deuteronomy. For the Lord your God is a devouring fire, and echoed in the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 12, for indeed our God is a consuming fire. A consuming fire destroys what is useless and refines what has to be cleansed. So it could be an image here of purgatory, or that state through which we go from this earth into life with Christ. It may symbolize, therefore, the purity and power of love and the presence of God as in the light and fire of a candle. And I quote here from the hymn lovely words from Bianca de Siena, who died over 500 years ago, beautifully translated, Come down, O love divine, seek thou this soul of mine, and visit it with thine own ardour, ardour, sorry, ardour, love, ardour, heat, O comforter, draw near, within my heart appear, and kindle it thy holy flame bestowed. 
I'm not going to say any more. I leave with you the thought that here is the most powerful expression of human and divine love that you'll find in the whole Greek scripture. Um, although 1 Corinthians 30 is not as great as the image of love, and that's true, you cannot actually improve upon some songs in these wonderful lines about victory.